As everybody knows, the Conservatives have their very, very exciting campaign going at the moment, which is the Zero Seats campaign. They're trying to break some new ground and destroy the party by just attaining zero seats in the next general election, whenever that may be. I know that Rishi Sunak was recently talking about how it might be. He was There were rumours that he was going to have it in June or July. And then there were other rumours came out that said that the, uh, the rest of the Tory cabinet said that if you do that, we will coup you because nobody wants that, because we will die a death at the next elections. But don't worry, conservatives, you're well on track to die a death anyway. And there was this amazing campaign video that was, uh, that was um, promoted by our friend Nima Parvini, the academic agent, uh, which I assume he got from the behind the scenes at the Conservative Party headquarters. And it includes some pretty brilliant and telling things about the Conservative Party. Uh, th this is a joke, by the way, but just in case, uh, I thought I'd let everybody know this is no, this a is real, a this is a real uh, campaign. Th this is a real campaign video. But you. If we just get it here, here's a nice summation of 14 years of Tory rule. Sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to let you know that we have a brand new selection of merch on our merch store. Uh, these won't be in the store forever, so if you do want them, go and get them now. Thanks very much. I think that speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. But if I skip as well, we can get a nice little idea of uh, where the campaign is going. Still some of you who vote for us. It is you, our voters, who we find the most disgusting. <laughs> See, excellent use of AI. It, it really is an excellent use of AI because I feel like this may have been generated by, you know, a memester out there, but I can only assume it was generated by a memester who had deep knowledge of the inner workings of the Tory cabinet's mind. As a collective unit, they have a spiritual and mental space that they go to. And this was gleaned from taking an astral projection, spiritual journey into that and just finding that they hate us. They despise us in every way, especially those of you who are still voting Tory for some reason, after every betrayal, one after the other. And um, I thought it would be important to talk about this because, of course, in the past, we've gone on about the Turkish barber situation. We've done some segments about it in the past. And I was very surprised when I went on YouTube to look at this to find it almost has 400,000 views because I guess a lot of people in Britain are going around their local town center and thinking, huh, why are there Turkish barbers everywhere? But it's not just a phenomenon that is specific to Turkish barbers. We have a range of other shops and accommodations that you'll find in your average British town center these days, which includes this, the vapes and candy shop with bongs proudly on display in the front, uh, front and center. Uh, we have- That's neither a vape nor a candy though. Bottles of Prime, horrible low price sweets to send your children insane with. And this is one of the things that I think sums up the view of Tory Britain. This is the high cultural watermark of Tory Britain. All of your, well, this is the culmination of 60 to, seven year, uh, 60 to 70 years of piss poor governance I also, in this country. The word candy is not British. No, we call it sweets. Yes, they're we? sweets. Also, they? it comes from Arabic. Uh, it's the Does it really? Arabic for sugary sweet, but it's been re imported to Britain via uh, America and American entertainment. But it, it's, it, it's very grating to the British ear. It's because they're not selling British sweets. They're selling American candy. Yes. They import American goods mm. and then double or triple the price and then don't actually sell them because it's a front for, for money laundering. Mm. Shock. Yeah, big, big, big shock. Yeah, that's, that's the big thing. In the <laughs> Turkish barber segment, we spoke about how the British police have actively looked into at least Turkish barbers for, as a front for criminal activities because one of the things that you'll notice about them is you'll walk through the town centre and there'll be a row of five or six of them and only one of them will have any customers. And you wonder to yourself, these have been around for at least a year now in my town. How do they stay open when they don't get any customers? Well, it's because they'll be keeping a second set of books that are lying. And those are the books that they'll present for tax because it's money laundering. From Same with things like this. One of the other things you'll see is that this is a phone repair shop as well. It seems to double up unless it's next door that's a phone repair shop. Uh, because the average look of your British town these days looks like this. It's uh, empty shop, empty shop, empty shop, Turkish barber, Turkish barber, vape shop. American phone. candy. Yeah, American candy, 
phone repair. Betting shop, pound shop. Betting shop. In some places, even the pound shops are closing down. <laughs> Things have got to get really bad. If yep. We're going to get 50p shops. And then maybe a nail salon as well, which is basically the same, probably the same money laundering sc- uh, scheme just by a different ethnic group. That's just the whole makeup world is a money laundering scheme. Yes. And of course, as I mentioned, those empty shops to begin with, take all of those shops that I gave you and just intersperse lots of empty units and empty shops because most British town centres that I've been to recently are beginning to look like desolate wastelands. It's pretty awful, but there's other features that you can expect if you're visiting your average British town, which is outside of the town centre, there may be a retail park with lots of big brand shops on it, maybe a next, a TK Max, um, a Curry's PC World, for instance. That's where most people would be going to shop these days. And there'll also probably be a supermarket or two nearby that'll sell all of the main things. But it means that the high street, what used to be the center of economic activity in any town, and a place of cultural activity as well, because there would be local shops selling non-essential items, selling you textiles, selling you lots of things, knickknacks, antique shops that will have vanished. In my hometown, for instance, there was a sweet shop that had been open for about 100 years. So non, non-essential, but it was all really nice. Um, I, I don't know if they were locally produced, but very British sweets. Gone. In the blink of an eye, just overnight, just bam, out of business. Well, the, the problem here is that there's a, a view from particularly local councils that we can follow in the American model's footsteps of you have this great big shopping mall that's an attraction, and sure, they do get attention, but also Britain is not organized. You know, our, our buildings are not built around this model. You know, America has lots of big roads. Uh, any Americans that have to drive in Britain will notice a difference immediately, right? That America is designed around the car in a way that Britain is not. Britain was designed around the horse and cart, really in a lot of places, particularly urban places where their street layout hasn't changed. Yes, and, and it, therefore it's impractical to have everything based around driving. In lots of towns as well, like you can see images of Swindon from about 100 years ago where they've got tram systems going through, which from my experience in places like Manchester are far more reliable and, and consistently on time than other public transport systems that you can get like the bus or even the train in many cases these days. Uh, Those were torn up so that you could make way for roads so that you could Americanize all of the town centers. But what do we have in the town centers now? We have these and empty storefronts. And it's miserable because it's all for convenience, this idea that, oh, you have the big retail shopping center. You have one supermarket where you can get everything. Um, But the convenience means that the place you end up living in is miserable. It's just a place where these people can launder their money and big, massive brands can make a load of money and employ lots of local people at the absolute minimum wage. There is an aesthetic component to living in a British town, which is vanishing very, very quickly. And I wanted to examine exactly why this is, because it's very, very easy, and we are probably guilty of this, to attribute everything to a kind of monocausal thesis of just saying, well, a lot of it's to do with migration. And obviously, migration, mass migration, is what's causing these to pop up because they are fronts for foreign criminal activity in a lot of cases, and you will go into every single one and find that they are, to a man, staffed by foreigners. So they're caused by that, but what's the cause for the towns emptying out in the first place? Because that's something uh, that isn't purely a result of this. It's probably got something to do with it, but I thought I would look at some of the other causes. Um, Because, once again, there's lots of trouble going on in the country. Here's one right here, an article that I got from just a few days ago that's talking about, well, just a few weeks ago, talking about how there was 14 store closures a day in the UK, leading overall to 5,000 fewer shops. So this was large-scale retail restructuring and administrations such as uh, Wilco's led to a net of 14 store closures a day last year with 5,000 fewer shops now trading across the UK. So obviously Wilco's was a bigger brand. It was one of the more centralized supermarket chains where it would push out lots of the local grocers, butchers, and places like that because it's, well, um, not necessarily butchers. I don't know if they sell sold food in Wilkers, but it would push out local ch- uh, local shops. But still, it does mean that what you get in its repla- it, replacing it is nothing. Well, one thing that I found interesting about Swindon is there was a Marks and Spencers in, in the center mm. of Swindon, which was where I'd get my food because it was actually edible. And um, it's closed down because there are all of these different ethnic shops. Like you've got a, a food shop for every ethnicity under the sun in Swindon, but not one for me. 
I don't want I don't want Nepalese specific cuisine or you know I've got to go to the polar shop and not even be able to read the labels because it's not in English. You know it's just frustrating that I, I want to be able to buy my own food from my own country. You are right. That we, we do get a wide variety of ethnic food shops that are all specific to themselves, and I would imagine what's causing that is all of those people in that ethnic group purely shop there. Well, of course, yeah. Yeah. So uh, across a lot of northern towns, for instance, you do get a lot of Pol- uh, Polish shops uh, selling Polish food that only Polish people go to, mm-hmm. so they're able to sustain themselves. Well, I, I normally go to the, the Polish shop if I have to, because at least it's similar to the food I'm used to. Yes. Uh, but it says here an average of 39 chain outlets closed each day while 25 new ones opened with a total of 14,081 store closures in 2023 overall. Despite an increase in store openings dominated by the likes of fast food sites and coffee shops. So at least we've got an abundance of fast food and coffee because we didn't already have enough of that. High profile, uh, high profile collapses such as Wilco, Paper Chase and Lloyd's Pharmacy resulted in more closures than openings according to research from LDC and accounting from P, uh, firm uh, PWC. So once again, what, what was causing a lot of this? And one of the first things to go in a lot of the town centers was what I was talking about, those, those um, local shops run by independent uh, entrepreneurs, often kept within the family. What was the thing that drove them out at first? Well, it was probably the supermarkets. The supermarkets generally, because they centralized all of the shopping, and were able to spread the costs and sell things at much lower cost than all of the local shops could, um, pushed out a lot of the places that just couldn't compete with it. And you may say, oh, well, this is great for convenience. This is great for being able to get all your shopping done at one place at a lower cost. But it does mean that the character of the local town and the people in the local town get less variety and less options overall. And once again, the character of these places gets destroyed when everywhere becomes a place where you get a Morrison to Tesco, and an Asda. That's, that's what it is. And in this paper, this paper is from 2005, so things will have changed since then, especially with online shopping, meaning that instead of even going to um, a brick and mortar shop, you'll be able to just order all of your groceries online instead. But I think this um, says something about the situation as it was back then that explains how we got to right now. So from this one from 2005, it mentioned in the first, uh, first page, it says, Tesco at the time took in one in every three pounds spent in the UK in 2005. Wow, that's loads. Yeah, quite a domination of the market, if that's the case. The the number of superstores in the UK rose from 733 to 1,147 between 1990 and 1998. Smaller independent shops were struggling to compete with the buying power and aggressive pricing policies of this big supermarket. In 1995, there were 230,000 banks, post offices, pubs, grocers, and corner shops in Britain. By 2002, there were 185,000. So in the course of seven years, that's a decrease of 20%. That's pretty enormous. By dominating food sales, they take away the choice to shop in traditional shops such as green grocers and butchers, make it hard for the new schemes to start and expand, and by targeting non-food shops, they could take away the choice to visit a thriving town center. Several companies, in particular Sainsbury's and Tesco, are also buying up independent convenience stores. So you just come into a local area, you buy up all of your competition. And once again, you can say there's, there's convenience to this and that people are choosing to go to these supermarkets. So they're making that choice. But there's also some of the underhanded tactics they were taking. So they were saying here, supermarkets were using very aggressive tactics to remove local competitors. The Proudfoot chain in North Yorkshire was a long-established local business, and when Tesco opened a st- uh, store in Withens, uh, Withensee, they sent money off vouchers to local households, giving them 40% savings at Tesco. Ian Proudfoot, owner of Proudfoot Stores, asked the Office of Fair Trading to investigate, claiming that Tesco was trying to put him out of business, but the OFT saw nothing wrong in Tesco's behavior. Recent reports suggest that they were repeating this approach in several cities with discount offers to customers. Local retailers are angry at what they say is an aggressive, anti-competitive tactic, even successful businesses can struggle to compete against such activities. Because of course, once again, they can spread out all the costs across all of their chains and they can, uh, they can take a loss for a short time if they know that these aggressive tactics are going to run you out of business. So they don't have to worry about mm. the competition after a certain time span. We've talked about this before, haven't we? When yeah. we're talking about um, antitrust lawsuits and uh, corporate competition. And Tesco's isn't even cheap anymore. Well, yeah, yeah that's, that's a that's rip-off. The thing. As inflation has come by and everything has got more expensive, Tesco isn't the same cost-cutting 
business that it once was. It might be cheaper than your local options, but that's only because they're under the same economic pressures to push all of their prices up. Uh, it goes on, in 2004, small grocery shops had a turnover of around £21 <clears throat> billion because it talks about the employment because oftentimes when they're trying to get into the local councils, these places would say, oh, we'll create lots of employment opportunities. So the small grocery shops, these will be the independents, total turnover, £21 billion, employed more than 500,000 people. The big supermarket chains had bigger sales. Tesco alone had a turnover of £29 billion, yet only employed around 770,000 people. So once again, the automation of it, the convenience, the fact that it's all localized and centralized into that one shop means that actually you're not getting more employment. You're probably getting, if you were to even it out, average it out, less employment per capita when it comes to these shops than you are with your local chains. And also, I can only imagine that's got far worse since they've introduced things like self-service and they've automated a load of the other systems because in 2005, we weren't as developed on those fronts as we are today. And um, they also go on to say supermarkets can use aggressive tactics to get their own way with councils as well. On paper, there are often grounds for local authorities to refuse permission for a new supermarket, but supermarket chains succeed because they have such large resources at their disposal. Threats of legal appeals can frighten cash-strapped councils to giving in. In the case of Sheringham, North Norfolk, uh, Tesco has taken eight years to win approval against a determined campaign by local people op opposed to the superstore. In other cases, Tesco prepares the ground, purchases land, and gets agreement with council officials well before it seeks planning permission, making it hard to refuse. So lots of just kind of underhanded, dishonorable tactics. But Alan Partridge is gutted. North Norfolk. You know. Yeah, I, I, I bet. But there's, there, there, I, I do want to say this doesn't mention some of the benefits of having the supermarkets in your local area if they are just outside of the town centre. Obviously, I've gone on to list a load of the negatives, but there were some benefits that could have from just having a brick and mortar supermarket open up near your next to your local town centre, which is oftentimes, in fact, in nine times out of 10, they will have free parking. And that free parking <laughs> is typically for about three hours. What the councils hate they hate giving people free parking, which often really frustrates the local t shops in those areas because it means that people are less likely to park up for a long time and go into the shops and buy things. It's almost like inefficient governance stifles economic growth. I know. And it means that at least people have an opportunity to park up somewhere convenient and go into the town center and visit the shops. And some places said about how you know they would be able to um, it, it did bring in slightly more business for certain shops if a supermarket opened nearby. Obviously, I would assume if you're offering a service or product that the supermarket wasn't. So that's that's one thing, and that was something from 2005, and the effects of supermarkets have, have already come and gone because now we've moved into a different age and we have online shopping, which has been another massive hit to local business because... As you can see here from this graph, this is going on in the US, but I would imagine that this effect is somewhat universal. This was if a fulfillment center was established near your area. Now, the fulfillment centers, if you're getting things delivered by post, just make it so that it's easier to get things delivered by post. Hence, they improve the ability of you to shop online. Unless you live in an apartment complex in Swindon, then you have your neighbors nick your post. Well, that's a very... That's, yeah, I, can't get post I was going to say, nodding. that's something that you both experienced. Yeah, I haven't had post for like two years. Really? It just gets stolen, so there's no point. I haven't had Aren't a letter in Indian? months. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right. Uh, but this one shows that the effects of the local fulfillment center making it easier for online shopping to happen means that the change in local brick and mortar sales reduced by, what was that, over the course of 48 months, almost 12% which I would imagine for some shops is going to be the make, and, uh, make or break between whether you're able to stay open. And then the next one, um, we have one of the big things, one of the big ones outside of just supermarkets, e-commerce. What's the big thing that happened in the past four or five years that you would say probably put lots of business um, out? What, what took them out? Locking everyone up in their house. Mm. Yeah, shockingly locking everybody up in their homes and me making it so that only certain shops are able to stay open. Because one of the things that you'll remember is that there were essential businesses, essential retail. And what did these include? They included retail such as food shops, supermarkets, pharmacies, garden centers, building merchants, and suppliers of building products and off licenses. Now, you could say there's some leeway, but mostly that ended up just being the big supermarkets were I'm, able to stay open. I'm personally amazed that there haven't been more conspiracy theories suggesting that Amazon funded the Wuhan lab that 
you know. <laughs> I wouldn't be shocked either because, of course, it was the big supermarkets. They were allowed to stay open and online shopping was still allowed to go ahead. You still had people coming to your door. The delivery times were maybe a little bit longer, but you had people coming to your door to deliver things. So this was a massive wealth transfer to those people who were at the top of those businesses. And we you- saw that um, just the, the wealthiest people in the world gained the most money um, they had ever gained in such a short period of time throughout the COVID times. And it's not surprising because anybody who was looking to spend their money was basically forced to funnel all of their spending into a very narrow range of services where they could get them from the supermarkets, the online shopping that was still open. And this put lots and lots of businesses, um, it, it put a lot of them down. And there is also some more stuff here. In January 2021, online sales in the UK had grown by 74% year on year. The latest figure, and this is from, once again, this is from 2021, May, this article. Uh, During these months, Britain spent an astonishing £93 billion online. Globally, new users are responsible for driving up 50% of the increases in online activity. Because once again, you make it so they have no option. People who may have only been spending their money at the local shops, they have to go there instead. Similarly, in the UK alone, 46% of customers have purchased a a product online during the pandemic that previously they had only ever bought in store. And here's a nice fun one. 11,000 new restaurants joined Deliveroo in 2020, and of these, 7,400 were small businesses. So the foreign takeaways who are employing illegal migrants to deliver your food using Uber Eats and Deliveroo, they were booning. They at least, they, they were having a massive boom during this period. So that's great. And we can take a look at the US figures as well. Dan recommended I look at this particular website, Visual Capitalist. I've used this one before, yeah. The historic US job losses from COVID, 22 million during the great lockdowns of 2020, which you can see here in comparison to all of the other massive job losses that had happened in the uh, past 50 or so years in America. It massively outdoes any of them. I think if you add all of those up, you only get maybe about half of the overall job losses that happened in the US during lockdowns. And here's the cost, the economic costs of COVID in the US, $16.2 trillion. And uh, here's the costs of post 9-11 wars, comparatively. Wow. Yeah. We can destabilize the Middle East for cheaper than locking down our own country. We could destabilize the Middle East almost three times over for the cost of we could, one national lockdown. We could destabilize it three times. Wow. Yeah, well, almost almost well, three times. I don't want that to happen, by the way. No, ni- neither do I. But that just goes to show how much it cost, which is absolutely ridiculous. And now we're in the post-lockdown period. Everything else has been going wrong as well. You've got the war in Ukraine. Yeah, you've got uh, massive levels of inflation. You've got the energy crisis due to the sanctions that we put on Russia, which have also been putting businesses um, we've been putting businesses down. So this is personal finance company Nerd Wallet recently surveyed 500 UK small business owners to see how they're responding to the energy bill crisis. Majority reported having already made cost-cutting measures, including 43% who had to cut spending and training and development. So if you, you're going to get worse service. 38% who put a freeze on hiring. So that's going to put strain on those shops. 25% who have been forced to let existing staff go. So there's people out of jobs. And then if those don't work, you go out of business. And uh, once again, all the, all the meanwhile, Uber Eats and Deliveroo kept afloat by the UK government, importing millions and millions of people into the country every single year who can keep those places staffed, which is brilliant. And then also there's been rents. Same problem that everybody in the UK has with costs going up all the time, including cost of living space. Also cost of business is going up with rents. Looking ahead, they say in this report here, This is from uh, October 2023 to 2024. We expect the rate of increases in some operating costs will slow, which means they're still going up, but just slower. It's the same as when they try and sell you that inflation is going down. Well, actually, the rate of inflation is going down. Prices are still going up. Uh, Medium-term challenges such as the cost of decarbonizing both their store network or, more expensively, their entire supply chain will drag on retailers' enthusiasm for new store openings because net zero has a part to play in all of this. In more positive news for landlords, our data on both headline and net effective rent suggests a return to upward pressure on rents in quarter three, 2023. So that's great if you're a landlord getting money from it, but for any businesses trying to stay open in the country, 
you're screwed because everything is getting more expensive. You're feeling the squeeze. Your businesses are going out. And then you have to close. And what replaces them? Well, let's go back to what this all started with. Da -da -da. This is why you get all of these. This is what makes space for your awful, hideous, Turco bar, uh, t uh, Turkish barber, Turco barber, <laughs> Turco barbos, the vapes and candy. I quite like that phrase, the Turco barbos, <laughs> Turco barber. <laughs> yeah, so I know this hasn't been a particularly fun segment, but I thought I'd just give you a nice rundown of a lot of the economic pressures that mean that your high street is dead, hideous, and full of foreigners. If you appreciated that episode from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site such as Common Sense Crusade with Calvin Robinson. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.